Hey guys, welcome back to The Knife Life. Today, I'm here with Chris Slickbald Andre, master leather worker, very well known for his knife sheets, his gun holsters, and just his overall carving skills. Very famous leather worker, very good at what he does. Today, we're gonna to be talking about what you need in your sheets. So as a knife channel, I really focus on knives, pretty obviously. Um, but with that said, a knife is only useful if you can actually get it to where it's going, and that's really where sheaths are important. Um, you have to have the sheath in order to get it where it's going, and if the sheath fails, then you have a knife either lost somewhere in the right. field or uh, sticking out of your leg or something equally unpleasant, <laughs> which we all desperately want to avoid. Right. So just to start off everything, what are really the most important traits that you look for in a sheath? For me, it comes down to just, you know, down to quality and fit. Okay. Uh, the holster is poorly made, it's not gonna last very long. And if it doesn't fit the knife properly, it's gonna fall out or, you know, potentially, uh, you know, tear itself apart as you pull the knife in and out of it. Um, I like to see a knife sheath that is lined with a vegetable tanned leather. Um, a lot of people try to line it with the soft upholstery kind of looking leather. Uh, those are almost always chrome tanned leathers and the chrome tanning is actually very corrosive uh, when mixed with any kind of water, humidity, anything like that. So I really try to keep that out of my holsters and sheaths. I always use a vegetable tanned uh, leather. Um, also I like to see every sheath have a plug or a welt. Uh, which is simply a little strip of leather that runs down the seam, the edge seam of the whole, of the sheath, and that protects the, the thread. It gives the blade something to run against. It doesn't cut your threads. Mm -hmm. Many people try to over uh, get away from that by putting a rivet at the top of their holsters or their sheaths, rather, well, the holsters too. Um, this drives me crazy. It's unnecessary to me. It tells me that you don't have faith in your work. That you have to put a rivet in there to keep that from falling apart. Mm -hmm. uh, it really disappoints me to see that. Uh, definitely need to have some sort of a liner in our sheaths and our holsters because it protects them. The most leather on the back side, the rough side, the flesh side, uh, is literally that. It's rough. It's fuzzy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if nothing else, at least it's porous. And as, you know, dust, if you're out in the field and you're using your knife and dust and dirt gets in your sheath, well, you can't just clean it out. It's, it's in that leather forever now because it's in those pores and you can't get down inside there to clean it out, you can't wash it out, you can't hose it out. So now it's sandpaper. You're running your knife up and down against that gritty leather, right? Mm -hmm. But if we have a nice sealed grain leather in there, dirt won't stick like that. You can, you know, in an extreme case, if you really needed to, you could get like a butter knife and a, and a rag or something and get down in there and just wipe it out if you really had to. You can't do that effectively if you don't have a liner in your holster. So the big sheath. things it sounds like are make sure that there's a plug that's going to prevent the knife from actually destroying its own sheath by right. ripping out all of the threads. Make sure that you actually have a properly lined sheath so you mm -hmm. don't end up creating uh, that sandpaper like you were talking right. about which can destroy the finish on an otherwise immaculate knife. And to make sure that you actually have the proper materials uh, involved in the construction of your sheath. Right. So moving along with the proper construction materials, um, you were talking about chrome versus veg tan. Mm -hmm. So can you go in a little bit more into depth between how, what the differences between those two levels? Sure. We well, even just like right here, handy, have samples of each. So this is a typical vegetable tan leather. It's fairly stiff. This is very thin. Have some thicker stuff. This is what I would, two layers of this. This is a five ounce. Uh, that equates to five sixty-fourths of an inch. So this is five ounce, and I will double this up to make my sheaths and my small concealed carry holsters for a ten ounce or ten sixty-fourths eighth of an inch. Nah, whatever it is, she, total weight. Um, again, it's very firm. It's very tight grained. Okay, uh, and it's vegetable tan. There's no weird chemicals left in this leather. Uh, that can hurt anything. You could eat this, wouldn't recommend it, but you could. Dogs dig it. 
This is what I call, uh, well, I call it cow elk. It's not a cow elk. It's cow tanned like elk. So this is actual beef uh, hide, but it's tanned to be an elk hide, but it's done in a chrome tanning solution. Uh, so when this leather came out of the tanning solution, it was actually kind of a light bluish gray color. And they had to back dye it to make it look like what, it, what you see in front of you. And that goes for all of your upholstery leathers, your clothing leathers, your jacket leathers. All of that stuff came out of the tanning solution, that light uh, kind of chrome blue color. And every finish you see has either been embossed and painted on or dyed on. Um, all of it. It's not natural. Nothing yeah. you see is looks natural. Mm -hmm. uh, other than hair on and this. This is about as natural as it gets. Uh, leather, exotic animals notwithstanding, cow leather has no pebble grain. It has no nothing. It's smooth and flat. If it has grain on it, it's because they put it through a huge press roller and mushed it in there. Gotcha. Period. Yeah. So those are the main differences. Like I said, you can see this is raggy. This is kind of firm, right? Uh, and they're just different applications. One's not better or worse. It's just in, in a holster shop, there's not a lot of use for this. Mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of exotics and things that I decorate the outsides outsides with, or you know, chrome tan leather that I can make straps out of, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But as far as making sheaths go, uh, if it's inside the sheath, for sure, it's definitely uh, oak or uh, uh, veg tan leather. So if you're really scrapped for materials, um, you. Definitely still need you to use the veg tanned leather on the inside of the sheath for your line. Absolutely. But you can get away with using the chrome leather on the outside mm. of the sheath if you're scrapped for materials. Maybe, and it kind of depends. You know, it's you're not going to get any body. Your sheath isn't going to have any body. It's going to want to be floppy. Mm -hmm. And if it, it's floppy and it, like say just over time it curls, mm -hmm. and you put your knife in there and it's a good sharp knife, it's going to come out the side of the yeah. sheath, right? Um, so when I say you know, what I would do if I wanted to use, you know, let's say this was something prettier than what it is, I would cut a window in there and put the leather in behind it on a leather plug. I would save the plug, mm -hmm. put the, wrap this leather over the plug and put it in from behind as an inlay. That's how I would put, uh, incorporate these more decorative leathers into a sheath. Makes sense. So following up on all of that, um most of the leather that you're going to encounter is just cow leather. Um, is there a particular other types of leather that really work well for sheaths, um, any other types of animals, or is it really, cow is really the go-to for that? There are certainly boutique specialty kind of places that, that do weird things with, you know, you can get uh, horse leather that's big in the shoe industry for soles because it's so very tough. Mm -hmm. It's not very practical. Um, for use in a holster or sheath shop because it is just so very tough. It's just above, it's just not unnecessarily tough to deal with. It's just hard to cut, it's hard to work. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen veg tan pig leather. I've seen uh, brain tan deer leather uh, and veg tan deer leather. Uh, I know my friend Paul Long is a monster master sheath maker. I look up to him as a sheath maker. Uh, he uses deer inside of his, and I believe that he uses veg tan deer inside of his uh, veg or brain, one or the other. Uh, that notwithstanding, um, not really. It's kind of a cow industry, really. You know, there's goat hides out there, but they're all soft like this. Uh, as far as veg goes, pretty much cow's the boss. Buffalo. You can get buffalo leather. In and veg. that works really yeah, well as well. Buffalo leather's nice. Yeah, it's not bad. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, somewhere over there, someone gave me a sample of uh, Cape Water Buffalo that was veg tan. Mm -hmm. And I haven't had a chance to carve on it and play with it yet. I owe him a, a carving, actually. But uh, so there are exceptions out there, but by and large, you gotta hunt them down, and buddy, you're gonna pay for them. You know, Cape Buffalo is a little harder to come by than your average beef steer, you know? Yeah. And that's where all the veg comes from, is out of your beef industry. Yeah, so it's really not really worth getting the fancy specialty materials, right. other than just for Decorative luxury and, and yeah. stuff like that. It's not going to give you any advantage right. that's worthwhile over the cattle uh, leather that you get. No. 
So one of the things that I encounter at knife shows quite a bit is issues with the stitching and with the edges being finished. Right. So are, is there anything that you're really looking for? What do you look for in the stitching or determine if, yeah, this guy did a good job with this and this is really good secure sure. um, stitching? You know, it's, you know, again, being a more or less professional leather judge, uh, the varieties of shows that we go to. For me, it comes down to stitch length, consistency, straight lines. You know, uh, edges need to be polished, sanded, polished, burnished, uh, dyed. Mm -hmm. um, I really hate seeing they do a nice job on the outside of the sheath, and you look inside the sheath, and the plug's not dyed. It's like this bare, just rough piece of leather inside. It just takes, you know, it's like a big scratch on the side of a car, a nice car or something, you know. Um, a lot of it, when it comes down to it, is is retention. Is retention. Um, a lot of people go soft on this, or they use all kinds of weird straps. Um, it, it should just stay in there. It should come out easy and pop in easy. Okay. Uh, no different. Now this knife. Let's see. So that's a little bit harder to make that a retentive sheath. You don't have the hilt and the uh, hilt and the guard to mold to. So we build a little strap in. What I see a lot of people do, and I think it's a mistake, is they want to rivet a, a loop right to the front, right on the front. And now you're, you're interfering with your blade as you're trying to get back in here. This one is easy enough. It's one flap. You hold it out of the way, and it's secured on there. If you're going to do a, a strap that goes this way, at least run it through and behind that piece of leather. That way, when you undo it, it forces it out of the way, and it's not naturally in your way when you're trying to resheath your knife. So, main thing is just make sure that you're creating a professional piece so that people will actually well, sure. be interested in your work. Sure, you know, yeah. if, if, you, you know if you're putting all this heart and soul into, into making this masterful knife, mm -hmm. you know, put it in something e equally nice. You yeah. know, it doesn't have to be fancy. It can be that plain. But that has, when someone picks that up, they're not looking at it. They're looking at even stitching. They're looking at a nice polished edge, nice consistent piece. It doesn't have to be fancy. It just has to be made well. One of the things that I run into is that I am not a leather worker myself, but having a quality sheath is absolutely paramount. So I actually contract my leather sheaths out to my sister, Jenna Allen, who is actually one of your students. She was my very first student. Very first student, mm -hmm. yeah. At 14. At 14. <laughs> and she does... And she was still taller than I am. <laughs> but she does really good work. She so does. Even if you yourself aren't interested in doing the leather work, take the time in order to find somebody who is and is willing to do it for you. Mm -hmm. That way, your knives are the full package and people will want them. There you go. Yeah. There you go. On the topic of retention, which we were just on briefly, that's one of the things that a lot of knife makers don't take into account when they're actually making their knife. So right. can you actually go into a little bit more detail on how to retain the knife in the sheath and what knife makers should think about for when they're handing the blade off yeah. to you to make the sheath for that? Oh, what should knife makers think about? Yeah. Using this knife, this is a Colorado cutlery knife for reference. It has a fairly nice taper to it, okay? There's no real sharp points on here to catch and drag on things if we wanted to make this. Uh, this knife also happens to fit in that, okay? I don't want to have to, if this was molded up here, say it was a different design, this doesn't need to destroy the sheath. You got to think about what sharp edges you're putting into uh, your knife. The other thing, and this comes up because I just happened to make some for some, an old, I had to make a sheath for an old timer. I guarantee that sheath costs three or four times what that knife costs. <laughs> but at the end of the day, that old timer had slabs that came out just parallel. Bam, bam on both sides. And this big old stinking guard sticking out there. And A, it was uncomfortable to hold, even just putting it in and out of the sheath. And B, it's a pain in the ass 
to have to deal with the transition from this thick to this thick. So having this little taper on here, for me, is paramount. Um, it's good for the customer because it's not going to cost them as much because it's not going to take as long to make a sheath for this as it have to design one. Because every you guys bring, you don't do anything twice. We have to make a whole new sheath pattern every time you come into the shop, right? For real. Mm -hmm. I'll never see this knife again. We'll get close. It's a standard knife, right? But still, every knife comes in, gets a brand new pattern. Every one, you know? And to have to figure out those big square scales like that, you can do it. It's just a pain in the ass. Knock it off. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're involved with the larger blades, such as the Bowie knives or the swords, um, anything along those lines, they still need to have uh, sheaths or scabbards, right. obviously. Right. Are there any special considerations that you need to think of when you're actually making those sheaths? Well, certainly, if, you know, the only thing you really have to take into consideration that would be vastly different is just the, the weight, the thickness of your leather. Mm -hmm. um, if you're doing some big, long, you know, Scottish Highland sword, you're probably even going to want to reinforce that with some... Uh, well-shaped, you know, solid core Baltic birch plywood or some other equally strong but light material. Mm -hmm. um, simply, again, because you don't want a floppy scabbard. Mm -hmm. Just for the same reasons we mentioned before, if it's not sticking straight out there, it's going like this, you're gonna, the sword's not going to go with it. It's going to go through it. And this is very problematic with the majority of the scabbards that I've encountered out there. Mm -hmm. Is that guys with the sword guilds will show up to practice and pull the sword out of their sheath, and their sheath goes from this to that. And te te technically, that's no longer a scabbard, it's merely a sock. Yes, there you go. So make sure that you don't buy a sword sock. Get yourself an <laughs> Exactly. Sheath. Exactly. So, but yeah, you want to, so you want to make sure that your sheath or your scabbard, depending right. on the size of the blade, actually stays rigid so you're not yes. inadvertently driving right. your blade through your own right. scabbard. Correct. It's very easy to do. It takes time. It's not going to be cheap, especially here. But at the end of the day, that's how it's done right. Mm -hmm. So your biggest competitor in terms of other types of sheaths is probably Kydex. Right. So what are really the differences in, in terms of vantage of leather over Kydex. Why should somebody pick sure. a leather sheath over Kydex? Kydex has a lot of uh, positive attributes to it. Mm -hmm. um, my biggest thing, as far as if you want to get technical about things, to me it's just clacky, it's loud. Um, it's ungraceful, it's not pretty. <laughs> leather, I, I'm a leather guy, so it's, you know, it's challenging. Uh, to answer that question without sounding like kind of a snarky butthole, you know. Well, this is but, the place to be the snarky no, butthole. No, it's okay because, like yeah. I said, I don't, I don't hate the Kydex guys. You know, if you want, if that's their choice. You know, they want to run Kydex. Y'all want to run Kydex. Run Kydex. It just, it's uncomfortable to wear. At least the ones I've had, and it's been a while because you know, like I need to try every day. Um, they're they're loud. They just, <laughs> I just, I, I just bothers me, man. There's no loud tactical things. Yeah. So go for a quieter and more elegant solution. I think so. Yeah, I really do. You know, I understand like a lot of the law enforcement guys um, that actually train, the ones that actually really go out and train, they'll go through leather holsters because at the end of the day, the Kydex will hold up longer. Mm -hmm. And now they've got all these, you know, liberal, sorry, douchebag, trigger mechanism-y, clampy things that you have to activate to get your gun out of the holster. That works better in Kydex because it's it can stand up to the all the other little gadgets you're having to bolt into it, you know. So there's a place for Kydex. You know, like I said, I'm not railing against anybody. Mm -hmm. um, just not in my shop. Yeah, but <laughs> one of the things you mentioned is that it's much more comfortable, which can be extremely important when it you're is. out in the field yeah. hunting or something like that. If you're carrying a knife, a fixed Good. blade knife for self defense or something I, like that, IWB against your yeah. skin, and whatever. just against you all day, every yeah. day. The Kydex can just really wear hard on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's just something that and leather really shines for. And there's plenty of hybrids out there, and that's mm -hmm. again, I'm, people are going to try new things, and 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 that's good. That's good. Because eventually someone's going to try something that actually works better than all of it. Yep. You know. Maybe I'll live through to see that or not. I don't know. Teleport the knife directly into your hand. <laughs> there you go. I don't think I'll live that long. Well, we hope so. <laughs> Modern science will solve for that too, right? Exactly. 
So changing topics a little bit, okay. uh, one of the issues that I have when a client comes into me and says, hey, James, I want a knife. Right. Uh, they usually don't have anything really figured out or what they really know what they want. Right. So I actually have a video, uh, how to commission a knife. I'll have a tag for that up in the round here somewhere. Um, but that's something that can be a really big problem for any knife maker is figuring out what their client needs, what they want. So right. what do you need from a client when they walk in with a knife and say, I want a sheath? Right. How are you, what, for what are you carrying the knife? Mm -hmm. You know, is it, you know, a convenience slash tact, half, I don't call this a tactical knife, it's just a convenient knife for me. Mm -hmm. It's easy to grab, it's right there, right? Do you want to carry it that way? Do you want to carry it this way? How high? Do you want the top of the, uh, top of the knife to be right at the belt, above the belt? You know, you look at the guy, if he wants a high riding three o'clock sheath, and he's got Dunlap's disease out here like this, and it's you can't, you, sir, you cannot wear a sheath like that. It's not going to work. It's going to poke you, and it's going to be really uncomfortable. And then you're going to be mad at me for making that sheath, so I'm not going to make it. <laughs> We're going to, and I'll talk him into however they need to carry that knife, you know, for mm -hmm. whatever they're doing. You know, a, a Bowie knife, like a big old Bowie. Um, there's a lot of ways to to skin that cat, and it just comes down to working with the customer if they don't know. And like you said, a lot of times they don't. Mm -hmm. uh, they just know they've got this cool knife. I've got a customer's knife over there. Uh, it was a gift. Beautiful handmade knife. How do you want to carry it? I don't know. I don't know. Just want a sheath. All right. Here's some samples. Pick one. So that's, you know. Um, it's Now, I get a little more detailed about it. If it is a tactical carry, we're going to have a little deeper conversation about where you're coming from. You know, a guy like you or your dad, you know, doing the martial blade stuff, that's a different conversation than you know, a biker that wants to carry a knife at a certain place, you know, which I get. Mm -hmm. um, come in to me and talk to me about a holster. That's, again, that's that deeper conversation. Where are you at? Where, how do you draw? The, the, all, these different, all these different things. And most people have no clue how to draw. Why, why do you want to draw from that position? Well, your body style doesn't, doesn't complement that decision. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't matter if you're big, tall, skinny, short, fat, doesn't matter. Not everybody shoots well from the same position. Mm -hmm. You know, I have I shoot best from a, a kidney carry 15 degree toe back. Uh, most people, guy like yourself, probably going to want to shoot 10 degrees toe forward at three o'clock because it's going to be more comfortable and ergonomic for that draw. And that's the kind of, same kind of thing we have to figure out for the sheath. If it's just a, you know, guy's riding his horse and it's just a utility knife or he's going hunting or whatever, this is fine. Mm -hmm. This is totally appropriate, right? Yeah. So, it comes down to personal taste. And it comes down to just being able to guide someone to their happiness if they don't know what they're doing. So the main thing it sounds like is make sure that you know what you actually want the sheath to be able to do. To accomplish, yeah. right. So try to figure that out beforehand or at the very least say, I don't know necessarily what this is. I'd like some recommendations right. on how to proceed on this. Right. And the other thing is that you're actually going to need the knife in hand yeah. as well to actually make it correct. You can't do it off of a picture. No, or I, like I call that. it a deposit. Yeah. So I charge. A I actually get cash deposit. You know, money deposits for holsters and everything else. But no, that's that's the deposit. Yeah. That you know, you're sending me a five. Back for the knife. You're sending me a five six hundred dollar knife. You're going to come pay that two three hundred dollar sheath price. Yeah. <laughs> or I get a new knife. Woohoo! Having you make a custom sheath or any other master right. leather worker is not a cheap endeavor by any stretch of the imagination. It should not be. It should not be. And it isn't. So after this person has made the investment into the sheath, uh -huh. what do they need to do in order to make sure that they preserve it and keep their investment essentially Generally, in good shape? Generally, keep it wiped off with a dry cloth. Okay. Um, you know, there's... A difference between taking care of, say, tack, you know, horse tack, saddles. Mm -hmm. um, that leather is typically finished with just oil, right? So it's not sealed. You don't want to seal a saddle necessarily. You want that to be able to take it in its environment and clean it and get it wet and all this other kinds of stuff. Because you got to clean that gear. It's against a horse all day, right? Mm -hmm. In a sheath or a holster, we seal that leather. And there's a number of ways to do it. You can use uh, lacquers, you can use waxes, you can use acrylics. There's a lot of ways to seal the leather, 
depending on what look or finish I'm after, right? Um, once that's done, once that leather is sealed with whatever it is, it's generally sealed. Um, you don't wash gun leathers and sheaths with saddle soap and water like you do tack. Um, you just wipe it off. Take care of it, keep it dry, keep it out of the sun unless you're using it. Um, the sun, a lot of people get kind of freaked out because they don't realize that even tanned skin gets tan in the sun. It darkens in the sun. I don't know, chrome tan, not so much because the finishes override it. So if I left this piece of leather in the sun and say it was laying half in the sun and half not in the sun, there would be a very sharp distinct line across there and the part that was in the sun would be many shades darker depending on how long it was there than the original leather. Uh, once we dye the leather, finish the leather, uh, unless we paint the leather, which you can do, that's most of your upholstery leather is painted, um, it's going to get darker in the sun. Uh, people ask me, oh man, I want, I, don't, I want it to stay this color forever, making a motorcycle seat or something. This forever. Okay, great. What I have to do is I have to take acrylic paints and I have to mix up something that looks like that natural leather color that I just showed you. And I shoot that on there and then go back and finish it out like a regular piece of leather. Because mm -hmm. that's the only way it'll keep its, its color. The only way. So don't panic if you see some right. darkening over time. Right. That's just the natural right. leather overall. But if you're out, you know, if you're in camp or whatever you're doing outside, you know, try not to leave your leather laying right in the hot sun. If you're using it, great, that's what it's for. But try not to store it in the sun. The UV is not good for leather. Mm -hmm. yeah. So just mainly wipe it down. Keep and it clean, yeah. Keep it clean, keep it out of the sun. Right. All right. So for the guys who are actually learning to get into your trade, who do you recommend going to both in terms of YouTube videos and books or right. teachers? Right. Who do they need to get in contact with in order to learn the right stuff? So I don't know a lot of YouTube video stuff. I don't spend a lot of time on YouTube. Uh, I personally have a uh, how to use a leather stitcher machine mm -hmm. uh, video out there uh, at Slickbald. I'll be adding videos. I'm hoping to get some done this winter. Um, I produce pattern packs uh, for both Western and concealed carry sheaths and holsters available at Maker's Leather Supply, Springfield Leather Supply, and Weaver Leather Supply. All three great resources. They have a lot of overlap, but they all sell something a little different as far as your leather uh, stuff goes. Uh, Tandy out there, if entry level stuff, their instruction is, is adequate. It's very entry level. The stuff that I put out is a professional. You're going to make the same stuff that I make with the pattern packs that I put out. There is a video at the American Gunsmithing Institute uh, that they produced. It's a seven hour holster making video. Uh, holster making and sheath making, pretty close. Um, that's out there. I did that's the video that I have done. Uh, Paul Long, I mentioned him earlier. Paul Long has a video series. I highly recommend that. It's Strictly Sheaths. Again, he is the grand master sheath maker in this country, if not the world. Uh, I know he's very famous in Japan as a sheath maker. He's the man. Um, where else? Once this Wuhan business is over with, we'll start getting our leather trade shows back. There's classes at those shows. Um, lots of classes. I teach at those shows. There's usually 30 instructors. Uh, before all this started, we'll see what happens. I will put you on uh, Maker's Leather Supply. It's not specifically sheaths and holsters, but they have a lot of just how-to videos, a lot of templates for different leather items. Um, and also, I want to make sure I mention Serge Vulcan. Uh, he's a Swiss friend of mine, brilliant, funny. And he, if you want to learn how to dye and finish leather, specifically, he's the guy. He's got a whole series that Feebing's asked him to do on how to use their products. And it is extensive and detailed and very thorough. Excellent. You bet. Thank you very much, Chris, for you everything. Bet, James. This has been very enlightening, and I hope it's very helpful to our viewers so. out there. You bet. So, thanks again for watching another video of The Knife Life. If you found this helpful, please hit that like button. If you haven't already, consider subscribing. There is going to be more videos like this as we progress on. If you like knife making, uh, if you like the history of the knives, if you want to learn how to take care of and preserve your blades or how to use them, this is the channel for you. So until next time, thank you very much. Stay safe 
and keep living the knife life.